to thank Jordan for reading the scripture. I kind of sprung that on him semi-last minute. He had a little, little bit of time to prepare, but thank you, Jordan. The question I want to wrestle with today is what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? So I ask you, how would you explain it to someone who has never been to church or even heard about Jesus? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? It is a difficult question to answer and yet I think for those of us who count ourselves among Jesus' followers, we ought to be able to answer that. We ought to be able to articulate it well enough for others to understand. Having said that, to be honest, I don't think that even I have a great answer to the question. I mean, I, I could take a stab at it, but the more I think about it, the more complex the answer becomes. And simple answers like, well, just accept him as your Lord and Savior seem incredibly inadequate and really, really only lead to about a hundred other questions. It really is not easy to explain even the most basic parts of the story. In his book, if you haven't read this, you've got to, Me Talk Pretty One Day, by David Sedaris, who as far as I'm concerned is the greatest humorist alive in modern times. He's our Mark Twain, I think. He, he told a story about enrolling in a beginning French language class that was attended by people from all over the world. And one day the conversation turned toward Christianity. And a Moroccan woman wanted to know what the word Easter meant. And so a, a Polish woman took a stab at explaining resurrection theology. And David quotes her. She said, he called himself Jesus, and then he died one day on two, on two morsels of lumber. Sedaris reports. And then the rest of the class jumped in, offering bits of information that would have given the Pope an aneurysm. <laughs> <laughs> that may be why when Nicodemus comes to Jesus looking for some answers about what Jesus is about, the conversation moves into some pretty abstract areas. Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above, or born anew. Jesus is truly attempting to explain what it means to open yourself to the realm of God, to become a follower of the way of Jesus. And poor Nicodemus is doing about as well as any of us could do when he starts to ask the obvious questions. What does that even mean, Jesus? And Jesus goes on from talking about being born anew to talking about the wind and not knowing where it comes from. And Nicodemus is probably thinking, okay, we've just jumped from being born to not knowing where the wind comes from. I think Jesus may have lost it here. But Jesus is persistent explaining that in order to become a follower, something very radical has to take place. It's like being born completely over again. It's like being born completely new. And you really don't have control over it, just like what happens with the wind. It just happens. Now, I, I chose to call this sermon Spiritual Lamas, because I think Jesus is trying to help us along in this new birth. Just like those couples you see showing up at the training center with their pillows, we need help understanding just how this birth process is going to happen and what we can do to help it go smoothly. 
But just like those new parents, we don't have much control over the transformation to new life. Jesus is telling us about a realm that is different from anything we experience on a normal day. A realm where the priorities are shifted towards compassion and caring. A realm where God loves the world so much that God gives a gift of new hope, new life, new reality. So what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? It means that you have opened yourself to a very different way of living and viewing the world. You open up to a transformation that is so radically different and complete that it's like being born all over again. Only this time you are born of the Spirit, born of that which you cannot see or measure, born of love, born of a new way of being human. And if you have a difficult time, and I don't blame you, if you have a difficult time understanding just what that means, Jesus tells stories about this new way of being. Stories that stretch our understandings of grace like the grace offered by the parent who runs down the road to meet and welcome the scoundrel of a son who has made a mess of everyone's life. Stories that stretch our understandings of who we consider our neighbors, like the generosity shown by a Samaritan, a person that we have been taught to hate who turns around and acts with extreme compassion to care for a man who is left dead by the side of the road. Jesus really does his best to explain what it means to be born again in the Spirit of God. It means that we start living in a new reality where we look for the best in others, where we go against conventional wisdom and we build bridges where others want to build walls. Jesus does his best to show us what it means by spending time and energy among the people that others have shunned. He does this so often and so much that he develops a reputation of hanging out with the wrong sort of people. And Jesus turns around and says, excuse me, these are absolutely the right sort of people if you are born of God's Spirit. It's interesting to note that Nicodemus comes in the darkness. He comes to visit Jesus at night. And I don't think that the author of this gospel accidentally has Nicodemus emerging from the darkness to visit with Jesus. Because in the Gospel of John, light and dark are key components in this gospel. In the very few ver first few verses of John, he writes, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. How do we emerge from darkness into the light? We know darkness when we see it, don't we? A few days ago, there was another shooting at another school. This time it was a middle school in Noblesville, Indiana. It's very near where Mary Ann lives. Watching the coverage on the news, there was a comment made by someone that really gave me pause. Someone said, these sorts of things are supposed to happen in high schools. And this is a middle school. Take a moment for that to sink in. These sorts of things are supposed to happen at high schools. That's darkness. It is the fourth school shooting this month, the 17th school shooting this year. That's darkness. That is a society that has become so warped that gun violence in our schools has become a normal part of our existence. 
It's time for a new birth. It's time for a new way. It's time for a new light to emerge from the darkness and show us the way. On that very same newscast, I, I record the CBS Evening News, and it was on that very same newscast that night that I saw a glimpse of what that light might look like. It came at the very end of the news hour. And I went online to find it so I could tell you exactly what it was. At Mountain Heritage High School in Burnsville, North Carolina, Rachel Newberry caught Ben Robinson completely off guard. He was a little surprised and he was a little shocked. Ben, who has Down syndrome, had no idea that Rachel was going to ask him to the senior prom. Now every year we see stories like this, a, a typical kid inviting a special needs kid to the prom, and they are stories of kindness. But what makes this so different is that Rachel wasn't trying to be kind. In fact, when she posted the video of her asking Ben to go to the prom. She posted it online and strangers started commenting that, that she, Rachel, was this amazing, incredible young lady with a very good heart. And it kind of put her off a bit. And she said, yeah, that's not it at all. I don't think me asking my friend to the prom makes me a good person. Now, to understand how Rachel became so wonderfully oblivious to her own grace, you need to go back years to where it started. Rachel and Ben have known each other their entire lives. They were infants together in Sunday school, and they immediately took to one another. Rachel was always the one person who could get Ben to calm down, and Ben was always the one person that she could count on. Their friendship is so unconditional that for the longest time, Rachel didn't even know that Ben had Down syndrome. And she said, I guess someone eventually told me and they explained it, she said, but it didn't change anything. No, he's, he's still my best friend. And the interviewer said, well now when you say best friend, you mean best friend? And she said, I mean best friend, yeah. She said, a little emotionally. That's what people didn't understand when they saw her video. 50 years ago, back when a lot of special needs kids were being institutionalized, I don't think people could have even imagined a utopian moment like that. A time and place where differences melted away and kids like Ben are recognized less for their Down syndrome and more for their ability to get down on the dance floor. <laughs> to move people, to move from a world where violence is the norm and our school children are being sacrificed on a weekly basis, to move from that to a world where they can just be children, enjoying the innocence and the joy of childhood. And that's to be born again. Uh, to move from a world where differences somehow make us the enemy to a world where differences are what make us more interesting is to be born again. To move from a world where hunger is somehow an accepted part of human existence to a world where everyone has enough is to be born again. To move from viewing the other with fear and suspicion to viewing the other as family. That's to be born again. To be a follower of Jesus means that we are to be born into a new reality. A reality of grace, radical hospitality, generosity, and love. To, to follow Jesus is to step into a whole new way of being. 
Nicodemus stepped out of the darkness on that night long ago, and after experiencing Jesus, even though it was confusing, Nicodemus was a changed person. If you follow along in the Gospel of John, he comes up two more times, much later in the story, when Jesus is getting in trouble, and the governing bodies are discussing what to do about him. Nicodemus stands up in the middle of that governing religious body that is rushing to judgment and condemnation of Jesus. And he stops and he says, hey, at least we have to listen to him. And later it's that same Nicodemus who steps out with hundreds of dollars worth of spices to help take Jesus down from the cross and bury him. Nicodemus may have walked away from his first encounter with Jesus confused and shaking his head, but the light made an impact on his darkness. So to be a follower of Jesus means that we take a bit of the light that we find deep within us and we use it to shatter the darkness around us. Amen. For the offertory senses today, I'd like to tell you a story that I heard a while back about a young man that decided to take his family to church one day. They sat through the service and on the way home, the dad started complaining about everything that was going on in church. The music was too loud, the sermon was too long, the announcements were unclear, the building was too hot and the people were unfriendly. He went on and on and on about all the complaining and everything he could find wrong with the church. As they pulled into the driveway, his son, sitting in the back seat, said, Well, you got to admit, Dad, it was a pretty good show for just a dollar. <laughs> so think of that as you give your offering today. Will the deacons come forward, please? <laughs>
grace, we hear your call to generous giving in the way you meet our needs each day and in the peace you give us which passes understanding. Having received so much, we offer all we have, our time, our talents, and money for your kingdom. Bless these gifts for the work of your church. Amen. You may be seated. And as we prepare to come to the table together, let us sing our communion song, which this morning is number 408 in the Chalice Hymnal, Come, Share the Lord. Mm -hmm. God's table, God's banquet. Come and taste the grace eternal. Come and see that God is good. Shall we pray? Lord, we pray that you would still our minds and quiet our hearts as we approach this communion table today. We ask that you would draw each one of us into your closer fellowship with you as we partake together of the bread and the cup in grateful remembrance of what you did for each of us on Calvary's cross. Amen. I like the line in the song that we just sang, no one is a stranger here, everyone belongs. There may be people here you don't know their name. There may be people here you've never seen before, but they belong, just as you belong. If you've ever felt left out, that's the opposite of what you should feel when you come to this table. Let us communicate.
day in our moment of silence, we are praying for CAST. For those of you that aren't familiar, that's coffee and sandwich teams downtown. Our church is a part of a, an interfaith effort um, four nights a week to have coffee and soup, sandwiches downtown for those who are, who are hungry. If you want to be a part of that, come talk to me and we'll see that you get hooked up. Let's stand and sing our song of invitation this morning. It's number 452. Here I am, Lord. together from many different directions, but many different things on our hearts this day, and yet today here you have touched us. May we go forth now carrying the light that is your love, and may we share it generously to burst the darkness that captures so many people, including ourselves at times. But Lord of light, we give you thanks. This is our hope and this is our prayer in Jesus' precious Amen. Please join hands with the people around you. We're going to sing our closing song, The Peace of the Earth. <laughs> Oh, uh -huh. 
Bible says? Yeah. Oh, oh yes. Um, a phone, a cell phone was found in the women's room. So if you're lose, if you've lost your cell phone, or if you were in the women's room stealing someone else's phone, and you dropped the phone. <laughs> Anyway, Amelia has it, right? Okay, if you lost your phone, Amelia has it. That's not only how I feel, that's how I look.